Hey everybody, it's time for Tana Book Tuesday with author Lisa Prysock, and that's me. I've got a cup of tea today. I'm even drinking in a fancy cup and saucer uh, with the Courier Knives um, picture on it. It's one of my mother's favorite sets, so I cherish this teacup and have to use it often. Um, I am drinking a Headley's, um, it says Pure Ceylon Tea. I don't know if you pronounce that Ceylon, but it's probably Ceylon. And, um, they're calling it a hand harvested garden fresh tea. So that's what I'm drinking today. It's another new flavor for me. I've had it around for some time, but I think I've only had it drank it maybe one or two other times, but it's very smooth and delicious, and I hope you have a cup of tea and a few moments to chat with me today. Today, I'd like to share with you a little bit about my great-grandmother, Kelsey, and the reason why is I'm going to read an excerpt for you from um, Hannah's Garden today. And this is a turn-of-the-century love story. That's the subtitle on this book. And my grandmother, my great-grandmother Kelsey, grew up at the turn of the century. So I wanted to share a little bit about her with you because I am blessed to remember her fairly well. And this would be a nice way to preserve some of my... Uh, memories of her with you. Um, so, um, some things that I remember about her. Uh, she was um, a wonderful woman of God and very quiet and very talented in a homemaking capacity. But she also had a career as a teacher for a time. And I, I remember as a child being able to visit her home in St. Paul Park, Minnesota with my mom and my sisters. And I remember she had two lilac bushes on giant lilac shrubs on each side of the front porch and they, when they bloomed, they were absolutely beautiful and very, very large. And I remember um, she had a big front yard and a big backyard and there were lots of trees all around. And it was on, um, very close to part of the Mississippi River. And across the street was um, a big hill. And I remember on one of my visits to her home, she had me go up on that hill. And I was, I was just a kid, maybe, maybe five, six, seven years old. And she had me pick some rhubarb to make a pie. She wanted to make a pie. And thankfully, I knew what rhubarb looked like, and I did find some growing up there and brought it to her. And later, before my mother went on to heaven, she told me that my grandmother, Kelsey, had a habit of finding something for everybody to do. She'd put you to work if you stopped by. Um, you'd either be weeding in the garden or helping with the baking or doing something. So she put me to work finding rhubarb and uh, she made a delicious rhubarb pie um, and she showed me how to make it. So part of my love from baking probably stemmed right there from that moment, that one very precious memory with my great grandmother. Um, but I can remember uh, she had um, a wonderful sense of humor 
and she was a very serious lady, but uh, she would often crack a smile at funny things, and you knew that, that she found some things humorous, and she was an excellent seamstress, and she taught my mother to sew, and my mother said that whenever she sewed a garment, my grandmother would turn it, my great-grandmother would turn it inside out, and if it wasn't done right, if it wasn't as nice on the inside as it was on the outside, she would take that garment and rip it apart and say, do it again. So, uh, she was an excellent seamstress, and I don't know how long she was a teacher. Um, I would, I would like to have known more about that aspect about her. I do know my aunts and uncles and my mother growing up uh, lived with her for, with their parents and, and with her for a few years while my grandfather was in between churches as a pastor. So um, I think that's why my mom said she would put you to work. She said that, um, you know, she would put everybody to work and, you know, she did a lot with taking children to church. She drove an old DeSoto, I believe, and, but my mother said that she would stuff all the neighborhood kids in the car and as many as she could and take them to church. And so many that one of the popular stories in our family is of Timmy, a little boy named Timmy falling out of the car. And them having to stop and go back and get him. And I do know in her older years, she did take people in and took care of them. And that's Kitty. She's always in my writing office quite often. Um, but she would um, take in the elderly and care for people. And she was a very loving person. And I almost never saw her... Um, without, you know, gloves and her purse, her handbag. She would sit it on her lap. She always had a slip on. She was very prim and proper. And um, that's just how things were done in those days. And um, she would often wear gloves to church and a hat. And um, I know that she was a middle child, so I think that's part of why she was so quiet, but I have great memories of my grandmother, and I'm going to try to share some photos of her in this in this video um, before the end of it, but so that's a little bit about my, my grandma Kelsey, and um, heritage is important, and we need to remember things about them, but she could bake wonderful things, and she was a great seamstress and a great lady, and I hope you have someone like that and some memories like that or knowledge of someone like that in your own family. But um, I'm going to quickly read an excerpt <clears throat> from Hannah's Garden for you that I marked off. And again, this is a coming-of-age, turn-of-the-century love story. Um, it is a great book for young adults. It's more like young adult fiction, but it, you know, it is Christian and clean and I, I'm sure that you could enjoy it even if you don't read that genre. But, um, so here we go with the excerpt. So you might have to look at me from over the edge of the book. While mothers with eligible daughters silently refused to give up hopes of Wilson noticing their own daughters, Father and mother certainly took note from where they were lingering, hands in hands, up on the platform, but neither spoke of it. And I'll have to give you a little bit of background in this scene. Wilson is a young intern studying to be a minister from um, Westminster Theological Seminary in Maryland. And he is in Kentucky studying with Hannah's father who adopted her and there's 10 uh, brothers and sisters in the family and in this scene they're at 
a dance. And so far, their relationship has been, Wilson and Hannah ha, has been mainly just a, a friendship. And um, she's been growing up and he's just a little bit older than her. And they spend a lot of time reading the word together in the morning on the front porch. But right now they're at like a barn dance during um, the harvest season. There was no harm in their taking a stroll where everyone could see them in the moonlight landscape by the clearing at the lake. It was as though whatever lay between Wilson and Hannah was frail and unspoken. No one dared breathe lest whatever might be in their hearts become somehow diminished or flourish, especially since Hannah seemed not to care overly much in the fuss surrounding Wilson's arrival or the commotion other ladies made in attempting to attract his interest. It was a complex reaction that Hannah seemed somehow instinctively aware. All of her senses regarded it, especially those in her heart. Mind if I join you to see the lake? Wilson asked. He sounded so relaxed, cheerful, and friendly that she wondered how men could seem so oblivious to the mood around them. Oh, hello, Hannah said, still surprised to find him there, even as her mind mulled all of her thoughts around. Not at all. I was... Her words, her words trailed off. What could she say? She couldn't say she was hoping to have some time with him, nor that she wished he would ask her to dance with him. That sounded too forward. Instead, she managed to recover quite casually. I was just thinking how beautiful the lake is this evening. Yes, it certainly is, Wilson agreed. He suddenly wanted to tell her she looked beautiful. She seemed mature, more mature than most girls her age, even more mature than most of the girls he knew older than she. Yet, he couldn't bring himself to divulge his thoughts. In time, perhaps, he was thinking, but he wasn't even sure of that. For now, she was a delightful young lady to converse with. He wasn't sure why he was drawn to her. Was it the fact she wasn't fussy and fawning over him as some of the other young ladies in Garfield did from time to time? He was glad to be away from the ladies that seemed to swarm him at the dance. He couldn't bring himself to dance with any for fear of starting an insurrection or misleading some young lady's heart astray with too great a hope. Didn't they know he was ready to settle down, commit to a dance with anyone, or begin a courtship which might lead to maintaining a wife? And here, here was Hannah, precocious and mysterious, serene, demure, soft-spoken, courageous in the face of adversity, talented and devoted to the God of Abraham and his son, the Jesus of the New Testament. Are you enjoying the celebration, he finally asked. Oh yes, I am. It's very refreshing. A chance for everyone to set aside day-to-day -day routine and celebrate life, she responded. Yes, it's a very nice change of pace, he agreed. She wanted to ask him who Corinne was, but it wouldn't be proper. She shouldn't have even looked at the return address on his personal mail. He was a grown man and could correspond with whomever he chose. He wanted to ask her about Fred, but decided since he hadn't shown up at the door to court Hannah formally that it must not be too serious yet. However, why did he even care? He told himself he was just interested in Hannah's direction and helping her find the path and destiny God had for her. But there was a nagging in him that his interest held more than that. Was she really just about to turn 18 in a few weeks? She seemed at least near his age, perhaps 22 or 23, with her calm and peaceful presence. He was thinking his mother would like her. Thanks for joining me today for Tina Book Tuesday. I hope you enjoyed my excerpts. Have a great week ahead.